we're going to talk today about the chemistry of paints and in particular of the finest red paint that painters had available to them for hundreds of years. And this is the pigment known as vermilion, which in chemical terms is mercury sulfide. This is what vermilion looks like in its pigment form. And this is a pigment that was known since antiquity, certainly since Roman times. Um, in older times, it was used in the mineral form. You can find this compound, mercury sulfide, in the natural environment, in the mineral cinnabar. But at least since the Middle Ages in Europe, vermilion was made synthetically by mixing together metallic mercury and the element sulfur, heating them together in a sealed container, and they were combined together to form this compound, mercury sulfide, which can then be ground up. And it makes this spectacular red pigment. Here you can see it being used in a painting of the early Renaissance in the 15th century by the Italian painters Masaccio and Masolino. Now there's just one problem with this spectacular colour, and that is that over time vermilion tends to discolour. It tends to turn brownish or even blackish. And this is something that painters have long known. In fact, even in the 14th century, an Italian craftsman warns that if you use this stuff in, in murals, just putting it onto walls, then it, the walls tend to turn black. Here's an example of that in a painting by a Dutch old master. The, these robes were once presumably a brilliant red. The question is why this happens, and that's something that the modern techniques of chemical analysis have allowed us to start to unravel. But it's been a long process, and the paper that I want to talk to you about today is one that is adding a step in that understanding. In the 1980s, it was thought that this compound mercury sulfide was turning into, from a red form into a black form known as metacinnabar. But that no longer seems to be the case. Now people think that there's a different mechanism at work. It has seemed for several years now that what's really happening is that the mercury sulfide is being degraded eventually into a form of metallic mercury that appears as tiny little particles that at these very small scales just appears black. So this, what, this is what accounts for the, the brownness of degraded mercury sulfide of degraded vermilion. At least that's the theory, but it's one that has been very hard to prove. You see, one of the standard techniques used to analyse the com chemical composition of these old paint layers is to bounce x-rays off of them and to look at the pattern of the reflected x-rays to deduce the crystal structure and the composition of the material that it's bounced from. Um, and this is a technique called X-ray diffraction. But the problem is that that will only work if the materials that you're looking at are crystalline, whereas mercury, of course, as the metal at room temperature, is liquid. And even in these tiny grains, it's going to be disorderly. And so it's not possible to use X-ray diffraction to prove that it's there. So this is the problem that Fabiana de Pieve of the Free University of Brussels and her co-workers, in particular Connor Hogan of the Institute for the Structure of Materials in Rome, this is the problem that they've set out to address in the paper that I want to talk about. And they've done that by using a combination of experiment and theory. So they've used x-rays to look at the kinds of materials that are present in a particular degraded sample of vermilion. The one they're looking at is actually from a, a Spanish monastery. But they've also used calculations, theoretical calculations, to try to understand the energetics of the kind of chemical processes and light-induced processes that might be going on within the vermilion, to try to understand what is possible and what isn't in terms of the transformations that can occur. And they found that they can identify several different kinds of mineral present uh, in this degraded sample, in this blackened sample. One of them is the, uh, the compound known as calomel, which is mercury chloride. And the idea here 
is that the, the chloride is being formed when the mercury sulfide reacts with salt, with sodium chloride and other, perhaps other uh, metal chlorides in the environment that is just brought there by everyday dirt. But this isn't the only substance that they found. It seems that first of all what happens is that the mercury sulfide reacts with chlorine to form a compound called corduroite, which contains mercury, sulfur and chlorine. And it's only once this compound is formed that you then get the further process that gives rise to mercury chloride itself. And what seems to be important about this is shown by the calculations that this group has done to try to understand the energetics of these processes. Because, you see, one of the problems in this idea that, uh, that mercury sulfide degrades to mercury is that it, 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 is, it was thought to be a process that's stimulated by light. But if mercury sulfide absorbs light, that doesn't give enough energy for electrons to be moved onto the mercury ions to turn them into mercury metal. There just isn't enough um, energy there. However, what this group has shown through their calculations of the relative energies of these different systems, of these different materials, is that there is enough energy provided by light to transform mercury chloride, calomel, into metallic mercury. And so they've shown that in energetic terms, it's perfectly plausible that metallic mercury could be found. However, what they haven't done is to be able to identify chemically the presence of metallic mercury. If one looks at degraded vermilion under the microscope, one can see that there are little grains of a white substance, which is presumably calomel, and also of a black substance. Um, but the precise identification of that black substance still remains to be determined. However, as a result of this work, it looks very, very likely that it is indeed metallic mercury that's being formed now, by understanding this process, one might hope that conservators will get a better idea of what is needed to protect their pictures from this kind of light-induced chemical degradation of the vermilion pigment. And what these studies seem to suggest is that what is going to help there is perhaps things that aren't surprising, that the, pa the paintings need to be protected from moisture. That's something that is already done when the paintings have a coat of varnish on them to some extent. Um, and also that they need to be uh, subject only to strictly controlled lighting levels so that the light is below the threshold at which it can trigger this transformation of mercury chloride into metallic mercury. So there is some hope that from studies of this sort, conservators might get a better idea of what they need to do to keep their paintings looking as brilliant as some of these still do. Here's the work that I've been talking about. And here also are some sources of further information about how vermilion is made and how it was used by artists.